<laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Katie Hobson and this is Julian McCall. Welcome to our session, A Target Market Should Be a Target Market, all about creating and launching brands to distinct customer segments. Please do keep saying hello and telling us who you are, where you're from in the chat box, and there will be the time for questions at the end. Um, <clears throat> so if you kind of type them in as we go along and we'll get to them towards the end. I will start by telling you a little bit more about me. As I said, I'm Katie Hobson. I've been working in creative agencies for about 10 years. I've run branding, advertising, and digital marketing programs for clients. Um, <clears throat> I work at Chetwood, and sorry, I work at Future Gings. We're a brand consultancy, and you can find out a bit more about us in the, our digital booth over in the expo section. But we are a brand consultancy that uses brand as a strategic tool to help companies grow, transform, or secure investment. We're a team of brand strategists, comms experts, writers, designers who work with organizations at specific life stages. So we work with startups, scale ups, and enterprises. And Julia, um, Commercial Director at Chetwood Financial, is one of our clients, and she'll be telling you a bit more about herself and about Chetwood in just a moment. Um, we've been working together for about four years, back when you were yeah. what, like a team of 10 people, and now you are over 150 people, recently ranked in the top 20 of Business Cloud UK's leading FinTech disruptors alongside some really well-known names in FinTech. So this organization is one to watch going places. Um, and when my colleagues and I at Future Kings were thinking about what we wanted to do with today's session, we instantly thought of Julia for two reasons. One, she's a super inspiring female business leader and today is all about women entrepreneurs. And secondly, because we knew we could have a really good chat about a topic that is core to Chetwood's ethos um, and will also be of utmost important importance of all business owners listening today and that is understanding your target customers. I'm going to be hosting the session as a sort of virtual fireside chat and as I said with um, <clears throat> time for questions at the end um, but to start Julia do you want to introduce yourself to everyone listening? Yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Julia. Um, as Katie said, I'm Commercial Director at Chetwood. Um, I actually joined back in 2016, so right at the start of their, of their journey. Um, I was actually technically kind of number one employee on the payroll, so um, I really was there kind of, I guess, right right at the very, very beginning. As, as Katie said, we, uh, you know, we really have kind of grown from from literally a handful of us to, to 150 plus. So it's been, yeah, it's been quite an adventure. Um, before I joined um, Chetwood, I worked at Capco, a management consultancy for a couple of years. Um, similar space, so doing a lot of digital propositions, but more in the kind of wealth management and private banking sector. Um, and before that, about 10 years at Lloyds Banking Group. So again, working a lot on customer propositions, uh, retail and digital um, banking. Um, but I guess what really kind of drives me or excites me um, is, is that kind of tricky combination of finding things that really deliver against customer needs, but also are commercially viable and sustainable. Um, that's what I think is, is kind of really fascinating. And, and clearly in this space, you know, what we'll talk to you about today, it's all about how do you get those insights? How do you really understand those needs so that you make sure that you're, you're kind of starting in the right place? Um, so yeah, let me tell you a bit about Chetwood because I guess you've probably not heard as much about Chetwood um, previously and, and part of that is because, well, it's very much a result of our business model, which is quite different, I guess, to the other challenger banks. Um, so we are fully regulated. We actually got our bank license back in 2018 and we were actually the only retail bank to do so that year. Um, there's quite a lot going on, I guess, with Brexit and, and other kind of environmental factors that slowed a lot of other people down, but we were lucky enough to, to kind of secure that. Um, and our business model is all about creating really targeted products for specific groups of customers. So we don't have, you know, we don't use the Chetwood brand as a kind of brand for all customers. We actually create distinct products for, for separate segments um, and we create the products, the customer journeys and the brand all around that, or all around that specific target market. Um, so we have different consumer brands that sit kind of within the, within the Chetwood family, if you like. 
Um, and the reason we do that is because we we think that customers have really different needs and actually a lot of uh, a lot of the bigger organizations out there aren't able to be as specific um, because of their technology stack or you know because of the cost to, to implement and so we built our business model very specifically um, to enable us to be able to do that and we do it for the companies too so we also white label and um, so we can offer other brands um, access essentially to our kind of financial services products and journeys um, but it's all about tailoring to the target market. So as Katie said, I guess an, an obvious topic for us to talk about today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start by just sharing with you our one and only visual of today's session. We're not going to be using loads of slides, but we thought it would be good just to give you a quick snapshot of what we're talking about when we're talking about Chetwood and their distinct product brands. Um, so that's what you can see at the moment on screen. But Julia, Let's start by talking a bit more about Chetwood's purpose and the significance of the title of our session today, A Target Market Should Be a Target Market. What does this mean for you? Yeah, so I think as you know, as you touched on, our purpose is, is all about making people better off. And I guess one of the things I am conscious of is, you know, people talk a lot now about customer centricity, but we really put customers actually in the middle of all the decisions we make, which I think, you know, certainly is different to anywhere I've worked before um, in terms of the kind of the lengths, if you like, that we go to to do that. Um, so we don't try and create products that, that work for everybody. You know, there is no one size fits all approach. We know that customers are different, as I said earlier, and so we understand those needs and we create specific products around them. Um, the technology we have enables that, as I touched on, um, but actually a lot of, a lot of what you know really kind of drives that from a strong starting place is the research that we do and i kind of focus on customer personas but then kind of extensive research through the life cycle um, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today cool see if i yeah there we go um so at chetwood then instead of one big generic product for lots of different types of customer you guys are creating targeted products for individual groups and their specific um their specific needs which feels really customer centric i think there's a lot of companies today who talk about being customer first there's a lot of buzzwords around customer engagement but really at its core what this is about is understanding the customers you're trying to serve and i think um something you talk to us a lot about when we're working together is you know remember i'm not the customer and what this means is we've we've got very different needs to the customers that we're trying to create brands and products for. So tell us a bit more about how you go about defining and getting to know those target market segments. Yeah. So the first thing, as you said, is you know really being clear on who your products for. Um, you can't you can't start until you know that and everything that you do on product on brand on journey so you know everything in terms of how you position yourselves your public websites um your your ongoing servicing needs to be focused around that that kind of clarity i guess of who your target market is um and as you said you can't just ask your friends um they might be your target market but they but they might not be as well <laughs> um and so you have to really kind of get under the skin of of who it is you think will buy your product or service um, and then make sure that you're speaking to them when you're doing the research. So the first thing is clearly to define that segment. Um, and the way the way we do that at Chetwood is we often look at where the gaps are in the market. So you know when we're looking to kind of branch out into another product, we'll see we'll see where are there you know where are there groups of customers who we think are either not getting products today. Um, so don't have access to certain types of product or are getting a kind of a bad experience, a bad product, perhaps. So, you know, can we see segments that we think are being poorly treated due to a lack of competition? Um, and so we often start from that from that place to try and define uh, a, a product and a proposition around a, a need in the first place. Um, but you can also look at your competitors. So if, if you know what you're going to be creating or you've already got a product or a service in the market, an obvious place to start is your competitors and to look at, you know, what is it they're doing that's work, really working for a group of customers and where are there potentially groups of customers who are not getting as good a deal? Um, is there something there that you can do to better design, um, for want of a better phrase, the, the kind of overall experience? And that can be a kind of a, a really kind of 
solid way, I guess, to get some insight from, from different types of offerings. And you might want to go quite broad with it. So you might not want to pick exactly the product category in you're in. There might be similar categories that actually have, you know, build a lot of insight into what you're trying to do. Um, so it's worth thinking about it through that lens too. Um, and then you, you need to create a persona. So we use customer personas. Um, they are effectively a visual representation of, of your customer base. We make sure that we look at them from an attitude and behavior perspective, as well as the obvious kind of demographic factors. Um, and actually, we there is lots of data out there, but the way that we often do it is we, we use primary customer research to help clarify who those customers are. So by by using the research that, you know, they become representation of customers we've actually seen, um, mm. which makes them really powerful, particularly when we try and play them back through Chatwood and make sure that everybody understands kind of how these customers feel, what they're looking for, um, you know, and what they, what they like. Um, and that's cool because it should drive every decision you make. You should be making your decisions, thinking about it through their through their eyes so really thinking about it from that from that kind of detailed starting point of who the customer is um, and if you already have a product or service so if you're already live um then i think the key is to to do the same process right do you really understand who your who your customers are are there differences in how frequent people buy products or services or the way that they perhaps come in to find out about you? You know, is that is that kind of differentiating groups of people? Do you get different groups, uh, different feedback, sorry, from different groups of customers? So are you hearing that people are having a different version of the experience through their own kind of lens of what they were expecting? Um, and all of that's really important to, to kind of understand as a starting point for, for whatever you want to build out in the future. Yeah, and I think whether you are just starting out now or you've already got a customer base, something Julie and I really hope you take away from our session today is to understand that customer research isn't something that needs to be really complicated or super expensive and that any business owner of any size can get started. And we're going to give you some insight now into how we go about it. Um, so, Julia, what's the approach? Yeah, so we test everything, as you've said. So, you know... If you're going to have that approach where you want to test everything, then you need to find a cost effective way to do it. Um, and so my first piece of advice is to do the research yourself. Um, I know that can sound a little scary and I'm certainly not undermining the skill involved in doing research. Um, but I do think that it can get expensive. And, you know, particularly if you're at the beginning stage of a, of a product development or launch, really kind of doing lots of research on the various elements is is really important and so finding a way that you can kind of sustain that behavior is is really critical and um, so you can invest time yourself in learning some simple research techniques we're going to talk a bit about them now and um, katie and the team i know have also got kind of a pack if people are interested in a bit more information so we can share that as a bit of a cheat sheet i guess to get you going um but also you know perhaps it's perhaps it's in budget for you to be able to hire a junior research um support so actually bringing someone in they don't have to have tons of experience but you know recognizing that it's an important area of, of kind of everything that you do actually and making sure that your launch is successful um, could also be something to consider um, so we don't we don't outsource research and um, we do it ourselves mostly because in the early days we we didn't have the budget to do it any other way. Um, but secondly, because you want to hear that insight firsthand anyway, um, it's really powerful to hear customers talking directly. And, and so, you know, for me, I want to be in the room if we're doing the face-to-face -face research, which pre-COVID we were, um, and I'll touch on more of that later. Um, but I think, you know, it, it really is critical to everything that we do. So being in the room to hear it is, is important. So questioning techniques, I guess, getting into some of the specifics, you know, it isn't it isn't that everybody can do research. You will need to think about whether you can do research or whether you know someone that would be good at it. Um, and there are a couple of kind of early pointers I can give you. So the first thing is that you have to put everyone at ease. Um, sounds obvious, but, you know, you've got a group of people coming into a space or joining you on Zoom who perhaps haven't done research before and um, perhaps you're going to ask them personal questions about their finances which quite often we do <laughs> um, you know or something else that might be kind of a really emotional topic and I think it's important that they know from the outset that 
you're not going to judge them, that there's no right or wrong answer. You know, we often use the line, we just want you to tell us what you think. There is literally no right or wrong answer. Um, and sometimes we say we're from a research company, right? So we tell a little white lie to try and get people to relax into it a little. Um, and so that they don't feel like they're criticizing our work or the team's work. And it becomes a little more impersonal, I guess, in a, in a good way, um, in terms of the materials that we show them. So you have, to, you have to listen carefully as well. You know, you have to, it's really active listening. Um, and some of it needs a little challenge. So, you know, you shouldn't, if, if people contradict something they've said earlier, it's absolutely okay to say, oh, that's interesting because that's slightly different to what you said before. And I really want to understand kind of why you think that. Um, so lots of open questions, super non-challenging, uh, really just kind of trying to draw out insights and, and put them at ease. Um, and that's, that's kind of the key. You have to make sure you're not leading with questions. So you're not saying, you know, do you like this or what do you like about this um, without doing a balance of the other side of the fence um, but ultimately you're trying to get them to talk and to share about either their experiences or their views on something that you're perhaps sharing with them so another point is we do always use um, a firm to help recruit our customers so you know the first part we talked about was identifying your target market and getting your customer personas so once you've got them, you need to make sure that you do your research with that group of customers. So the screener's job is, you know, it's a set of questions. It's it's there to make sure that the people who end up in the session are the people in that target market. So there's the obvious stuff you want to think about in terms of, you know, do you have a particular gender skew on your product or service, or actually are you looking for a 50-50 split to be representative? You know, do you have an age um, or an income perhaps? demographic but there's also perhaps experience led so do you want someone that's using a similar product today or maybe even a competitor product um, or do you want someone that's actually not using it but you think would have a need because of some other factor in their life and um, so really thinking through kind of what those good questions would be to get the right customers in the room is important and working with the right recruitment company they'll help you kind of lead through that and, and make sure that you're doing research with the right people um, and then when we've got the customers and I'm going to talk about what we do kind of pre-COVID and then I'll touch on how it shifted <laughs> slightly. Um, but generally, we like to do a style called co-creation and you, you can research it. There's quite a lot online about it. It's fairly common now. It's just very different to the traditional kind of focus group sessions. Um, and the key is that you use small groups of customers. So we have probably four or five as a maximum probably more like four is our norm um, with each facilitator. And, you know, the way that we do it is we very much get people to move around the room. So the facilitator is, is using the same content for the session. And um, so they're kind of, their role is static, if you like. They're obviously responding to different customers, but they've got a kind of a set of questions and a methodology they're following. Um, and then customers are moving around the session to, to see different materials and, and that keeps them kind of engaged and awake and all that good stuff, um, which also helps. And the small groups is really important because it's too small a group to hide. So people have to kind of get involved and you can also bring people into the session if they're not, you know, it's much less intimidating to say, Katie, what do you think in a group of four than it is a group of 12 around a table? Um, and so you can really kind of bring people in and get people contributing. And you can also manage the people that over contribute. So there's often people that want to talk all the time and you might need to rein them in. And again, it, it's just much easier to manage in that small group without kind of closing people off. Um, we're saying we dictaphone record everything. It just means you can really listen and you can really engage in the session without having to worry about, I've just missed that great line or that quote. Um, so we dictaphone the 20 pounds on Amazon, best investment you can make. Um, and it just gives you loads of time then to, to kind of re really go through the insights and make sure that you're, you're also doing the analysis from a, um, a kind of a, an analytical point of view so you're actually listening to the whole session again and being really clear about how many people thought what and you know what were the themes rather than kind of random comments that might stick in your head more than others and um, so that's kind of a key a key part of it and when we test product features so we normally start with some early kind of exploratory um testing around how the product or the service might work um, and we, we normally start by getting customers to talk about their experience of using a similar product. So, you know, what was it like when you took your last credit card out? Tell me what you remember about the journey. Tell me what was bad and what was great about the journey. What were the pain points? And we'll use those open conversations um, to really just guide that kind of really broad insight. 
Um, and we'll do that across, as I said, slightly broader areas than perhaps what we're focusing on at that point in time, because there's lots you can learn from similar journeys. Um, so that's really critical. And then we use sketches. So we often use visual aids. Um, it helps make things a little more real for customers rather than just saying, you know, if you ask someone, you know, what sort of product would you like? Um, it's very hard for us to kind of think that theoretical kind of way. Whereas if you show lots of different ideas, it's very easy for us to say, I don't like that. That's not clear. I don't understand that. And um, mm -hmm. that looks great. And and so actually we go broad. We We create kind of low and high fidelity sketches. So different levels of finished, I guess. So some that are very sketchy. And if you're creative, you can literally draw them. And that's great. And if you're not, you can use digital tools like Balsamic to help because um, they kind of create that sketch like impression. Um, and they just, as I say, give give customers something to, to kind of feedback against and for you to use as a facilitator to kind of guide the questioning. And um, so that's that's kind of a really a really simple way to do it. Um, we also use some quantitative research alongside so that can literally be as simple as getting people to to rank features as they come in the door so give them a list of 20 features and ask them to pick the top five bottom five of things that would be most important to them in a product that's still quant you have to do quite a lot of it before it's meaningful but if you do it on every research session you start to build a you know a real kind of set of data behind actually how things are coming out and it is important to do that because if you only speak to customers about things, they it's very easy to say that things are that you'd like things. You know, you can test all sorts of things that we know haven't been successful and and ask people if they like them and they'll they'll tell you that they do, but doesn't mean they'll actually use them, right? If if you question any of us about, you know, I don't know, our pension planning, we would probably all come up with a really sensible version of what that should look like. You know, how would we plan our pension? Um, but what do we actually do day to day? Most of us do nothing, right? And I'm definitely in that category and I work in financial services too. So it's it's trying to get across some of those boundaries, I guess. And, and quant is a really great way to get people to trade off between things. So, you know, when push comes to shove, which five do you pick? And actually, you know, you, you end up getting a real, a really strong clarity, I guess, on on what's critical and what's nice to have. Um, so that, that's really useful. We do do surveys. So, you know, if we've got a big decision to make, if there's a decision that's been really unclear in the qual research, sometimes we'll put that out and do a survey of 250, 500 customers. But in the main, we're doing small bits of quant alongside every qual just to kind of really drive out those kind of decision points. So I've mentioned a few digital tools as, we, as we've gone through. Um, we did used to do all of this face to face. Obviously, during COVID uh, lockdown, we, we haven't been able to, but we still had products we needed to get to market. So we've actually done 150 or well, more than 150 interviews now um, since lockdown, and they've all been one on one Zoom calls. And we've done that with one full time person um, and one part time um, person on, on the research side. So not a team of 20 by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and actually, it's been really effective. We've found that most customers, you know, most people in their social lives are using Zoom. So actually, most customers have been fine with that. We also put it in the screener to say, you know, part of this process will be on Zoom. You need to have a laptop or have access to a computer um, and you need to be comfortable using Zoom. Um, and in the main, actually, because they're one on one in, in many respects, it's been a really engaging way to get feedback. Um, the limitation or the reason we don't normally do one to one is it just takes longer, right? You've got to speak to 150 people. Um, whereas if you can do four for every facilitator, you can actually run multiple sessions on the same day. And within two days, you can have spoken to 100 customers. So it's a lot quicker to kind of do face to face, but you can absolutely do it in lockdown. And um, even screen share and, uh, you know, we've been sharing some kind of app screens and all sorts of digital um, screens, but we've been able to do that remotely as well, um, and it's still been really effective. Katie, do you want to talk about how we test brands? Because I guess I've touched on product, but another area that we do a lot of research on is branding, and obviously you guys are central to that. Yeah, so we actually get started on the brand strategy and identity quite early on in the process, usually once Julia and her team have defined that target segment and some of those key product features are drafted out. So when we work with Chetwood, brand is tested and iterated at the same time as like the product and UX is being tested and refined. At Future Kings, we use our step, jump, leap methodology when creating brands. And this specifically pushes creative roots apart. 
um, so kind of from the more expected through to the more unexpected in the category. Um, and pushing your brand concepts apart is great for research because that differentiation really helps customers kind of understand what you're putting in front of them, what you're showing them and understanding their reactions. Um, we test three prototype brands. So that's kind of propositions, names, designs, copy. And while these are really pulled apart, we have still positioned all of these brands around our target market, these personas that we've been learning about through the research. Um, specifically for research, the way we test these prototype brands is that we mock up things like billboards and home pages, things that customers can actually like understand and comment on. And while they look really highly designed, I think it's important to say that at this point, we don't spend ages and ages crafting them because what we want to do is get that customer feedback really early on. And so we take that feedback from the customer, like from the customers in the early sessions, and then we iterate and revise and refine until we get a clear winner. That brand that's evolved, that custom, that means customers really understand, you know, what the product is, who we are, what we stand for. And once we've defined and finalized that brand identity, we can start testing again as we start to build the brand out through things like websites, you know, comms, app screens. And working with Chetwood, we make sure that we test every single brand asset with our target customers. Cool. And then, so as Katie said, we've, we've tested product, we've tested brand, and we've actually tested those in parallel. And um, as Katie said, it's important that we do it kind of really early on. And actually, you know, we do the same with journey. So for us, customer journey is about how our customers buy our product online and then how they'll service them online so how they interact with the products over time um, but if you don't if you don't have an online journey if people are perhaps using your your website for research um, or you know you want to test how social media works um, how customers will respond to different messages or advertising um, this, the same thing is true right that, that journey flow in terms of where are you asking the customer to go where are they going next what's that call to action and um, it you know it kind of applies to, to lots of different areas so um, for us we follow the same approach we mock it up we start on paper um, and take people through and, and we're testing the copy so you know the way that we've written it the journey the the instructions the guidelines the you know how friendly it is the tone of voice and um, does that all resonate and work um, and we're also testing the flow so you know is it is it logical do customers understand so we'll quite often say what do you expect to happen next before we show the next page to kind of really get a feel for kind of how it's how it's going um, and we obviously do a more digital version of that as we get further down the research but that early point um where we're doing the paper based is actually just as important um because you're testing different things really and and essentially as you move down the line it you know it is more usability it's device led etc um and i think I guess the, the point on all of it is you've got to turn those insights into action. So, you know, at the end of it, you're looking across all those three areas and often, as I said, in parallel, and you're looking for the themes that stand out and how it all then ties back together. Um, and at the end of it, you are then starting to test it all together. So, you know, what does it look like? What does the journey flow look like when it is branded and it is talking about the product and how do they all work together? Um, and it's really important that you do that final stage to, to make sure it's a coherent proposition. Um, and, you know, ultimately customers have told you everything you need to know. So, um, you know, it's really about making sure that you're, you're, you're kind of clear on what you do next with it and that you've got those kind of themes as opposed to, as I said earlier, random bits of insight that will come through too. Okay, cool. Well, we've got just over 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna ask Julia a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll ask you guys if you've got any questions. Um, you were just saying that your customers have told you everything you need to know. And um, I think that's something else that um, you and I want everyone today to take away from this session is that you actually have to listen <laughs> you know you have this vision of what your brand name will be what the product will look like when it launches and you test it and the customers hate it or they don't understand it and this is something that you and i have been through a few times right earlier this year we went back to the drawing board on something because people kind of weren't really either loving or hating this brand it was a bit meh and i think it would be great to talk a bit about what that's like when you, from a personal perspective, have a vision of what your brand will launch and look like, um, and that's not going to be the case. What have you learned going through that process? Yeah, I mean, you're right. There's been loads of experience, like loads of examples, I guess, over the over the time. And 
the main thing is you have to go into it being fairly open about what you're going to hear. So as I said, we test things we know we don't like, and sometimes customers like them, right? And we know we don't like them. They might not fit with our purpose. They might not fit with what we're going to do, but you still learn and you still get insight from that. So it's being really clear about what the research is for at each stage. And then having, you know, being able to set aside your ego and, and, and being kind of open to going in a different direction. I always think it's, better to learn early on that it isn't going to work as opposed to launching it and then finding out that it wasn't quite right for your target market and um, so it is important that you listen to it and as you say it isn't always what you want to hear um our ceo often talks about the fact that he really hated the name of our first lending brand and it, it was our first brand right so it was pretty important um but he really didn't like the name live lend but customers consistently picked it in research they consistently said it fit with the proposition you know that they really kind of it, it stood for everything they wanted in a brand um and so we we chose it right that is our brand um, and he's kind of grown to like it over the last six months or so, I guess, 18 months or so. Um, but what's important is that if you're going to do the research and spend the time, you're, you're prepared to make changes. And I guess for me, that's why you need to do that research so early on so that you still can make the changes. You're not committed down a route um, or already fixed. You know, ideally, you do it right at the beginning of the, of the development so that you can you can kind of really get that insight and, and be quite dramatic I guess in how in how much you follow it at that stage um equally I get asked quite a lot how do you know you don't bias the research and I pretty much know I don't because every time you guys create a set of brand I, you know I've always got my favorite you always do right when you look at a set and it invariably isn't the one customers pick uh, so it, it also gives you confidence I guess that the research is working um which is you know it's also important kind of as, as you go through the process um and the only other thing I'd, I'd say I guess is you can there can be too many ideas so you know if you come out of the research and actually you're thinking well some customers like this brand and others like this and you know these product features are quite important to some and not to others you know the, the thing to do is be really clear on that target market so go back to the to the kind of personas make sure you're clear on is it a different set of customers that are following a different route and if it is it might be that you've got two product propositions um, that would work for slightly different versions of the segment and that's and that's great right you've got too many ideas that's good um, but you just need to pick one to go after first and be really clear that you're not muddling between them um, and, and have that kind of confidence again to separate them out and put one on the shelf and, and carry with, on with one. Cool okay so we have our brand we have our product and it's time to launch what happens next? I, I mean, I guess as I, I'm imagining everyone would expect me to say by this stage, but um, you, you know, you don't you don't stop researching, right? It's there are a number of things you can do. The first is you've got some data now, so go look at what your actual target market looks like. Are they the are they aligned to the personas? Are they the same group of customers you're expecting to get? Um, if not, that's not a problem. But you need to understand if you have you actually researched the product with them. Do you understand their needs? Is it actually a broader segment than you thought, which might be good news for the business, but you know, you just need to get kind of into that target market and make sure you you kind of really understand who they are. Um, you can also use you know Google Analytics, which is great. You might have a sales team or customer contact team that are getting insight from customers. You might be on review sites, so people might be writing reviews on things like Review or Trustpilot, um, and all of those all of those kind of feedback mechanisms act as kind of you know really important insight when you go live. Um, and one of the things we do a lot of is we you know we really look for kind of whether that brand proposition is coming through. So when customers write reviews for us, actually one of the most important things for me is they use words like fast, fair, flexible, and these are all words that we. We wanted the proposition to stand for and it really is it really is kind of delivering against what we intended um and so you know that's that's kind of a really key proof point um to actually understand so you're taking all of that insight you're still doing face-to-face -face research you're still doing quant surveys you're still doing email surveys there's all sorts of ways you can talk to your actual target market as well as kind of um perhaps you know new target markets for new products and i think you know just as a kind of a bit of a, a finish to that section, I suppose. I, I think the key for us is that, you know, we're so passionate about finding those segments and then creating the products and brands that are right for them. 
Um, and it's all it all comes back to knowing those customer needs and clearly people's needs change over time. So, you know, for me, it's it is that kind of continuous loop to make sure that you're still listening to your customers, still understanding them and evolving your brand as well as your proposition um, as, as they change. Yeah, exactly. Just as the pro proposition changes, we also make sure we keep our brands live and something that's evolving yeah. as well and responding. Um, cool. So I'm going to have a little search in the chat box to see if there's any questions in here. Um, but if you've got any now, perhaps people could type them in. Oh, here we go. Um, right. So question, question from Keevner in Chester. Um, what do you think some of the biggest mistakes are people make when they're researching? I guess oh, I think probably the first one is that they go too narrow. So people want to test something really specific and they only test that. Um, I often say if you're going to test, you know, if you're going to test a load of ideas, you understand how they all work. If you just test one idea, you will make that idea better through research because you'll get feedback from customers about how it should be made better. But you won't understand if there was a totally better idea over here. You know, so if we're looking at product features, if we if we test five product features, we'll learn whether those five are important and how important and how they rank and how to position them. But there might have been another five. So we'll, we'll always start with 30 and we'll test not all 30 together, but you know we'll test it in quant and we'll test it in different um, product propositions to really see what stands out. Um, and I think often people go into research with a really clear view of how they want to nail nail it down. So, you know, they want to kind of come out of it with a firm decision. So they sort of take things that are perhaps too finished um, and and just try and get feedback on a kind of narrow route. Um, so yeah, I think it's about being really broad, particularly in those first sessions when you're speaking to a, perhaps a completely new target market. Um, you know, you really can't go too broad. Like you're just trying to understand kind of where they are and and how things are working for them today. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes. I guess you know the other piece for me is just old school customer research focus groups. I think there's tons that's wrong with it, but I think I've probably covered a lot of that as we've gone through. <laughs> um, are there any more questions from anybody? Um, ah, here we go from Laura. Is it worth spending some budget on market research experts to build a really good understanding of the new target market? Yeah, can? definitely. If you can, 100%, right? And I'd, you know, I've come from a background of doing some research and lots of proposition development. So it wasn't totally alien for me to kind of step into this place. Um, I'd run research at Capco. I'd worked with some great people there that, you know, that, that knew how to facilitate facilitate and had effectively taught me so if you're if you're completely kind of starting from scratch you know nothing about it I would 100% do that uh, particularly if you've got the budget right I just wouldn't not do research because you don't have the budget to do it I would still go out and do some because I still think you'll learn lots and it is you know it really can be so cost effective it's your time sure um, and you do have to offer an incentive to customers to to come and partake um, but really normally that's 25 30 pound an hour and You'll be amazed at how willing people are, particularly actually in lockdown, to to kind of partake in research. Um, and you know, actually, anecdotally, but when I when I did a lot of the stuff in wealth management and private banking, you know, some of the companies I would work for as a consultant would say, "But these are people that have got you know millions of pounds in investments. They're not going to come and talk to you about research." Um, and they were wrong because actually, you know, and yes, we offered them perhaps a hundred pounds for two and a half hours, um, but no more than that. And people are interested in giving you their opinion. Um, and actually in almost every segment, you can find a group of people that are willing to come and talk to you um, just because they're engaged or they're interested. So if you can spend the money, a hundred percent. If you can't, I would do it anyway, <laughs> um, because you'll still learn some stuff. Yeah, and and I think like you said, when you're just starting out, it's quite surprising how easy it is to find people that are willing to come and have some pizza yeah. and, and give the, give you their feedback. It's just the watch out there is like, is it just your friends yeah. kind of coming for pizza? But there are always ways you can get started. Um, we have actually come to the time to the end of our session. Um, Stephanie, I see you have asked a question. Um, ping that to me separately, and Julie and I will get back to you on that one, but I'm just worried that we'll end up overrunning. Um, 
but thank you very much to everyone for listening in while we've been talking about the importance of target markets and creating targeted brands for customer segments and um, get in touch with us if you want to find out anything else um, you can find out more about Future Kings over in the expo area. Um, and I think now we'll say goodbye and it is time for the speed networking session um, where I think if you click on the networking tab over on the left, you'll be able to go and start with the next part of the day. Cool.